And all the people said amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bishop Omede, please come and join us on the pulpit. Hallelujah. So glad to have Brother Omede with us. Amen. He's living large. He got it going on. He lives in two different countries, two different cities. Amen. And uh, we are so thankful to him today, always when he comes home. And the Lord led him to start a work in Nigeria, and uh, the church there is going well. With over 350 new members there in the work that just started. And just in a year and two months, they already have 350 members and building a new edifice. I call him my bishop, he says. His dad was the bishop, he's not, the, but I'm speaking in faith, he's my bishop. And uh, I'm always honored to see him and to have him with us. We are thankful to Sister London, is that her name? Yeah. Like the city? What's your first name? Dominique. Dominique. All right. Like the island? No. no? Okay. <laughs> Looks like they named you after all of these countries. All right. Well, anyway, thank God. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise for her. Amen. Thank you, Brother Bobby. God bless you. And we thank God for the choir and for our praise team. And amen. Amen. Bless you for the musicians. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, I don't know why, but this morning, this sermon was longer than it looked on paper. I usually have an idea of how long the sermon is supposed to be, but I figured it out. It's because this morning they didn't want to say amen. And so I had to belabor the issue. Yeah. So now I'll make a deal with you, amen. If you say amen, I won't be long. <laughs> Y'all are such heathens. <laughs> Hurry up, it's Super Bowl Sunday. Amen. Many of you know that uh, my mother's last sibling, her oldest sister passed away in Texas. My Aunt Juanita, Betty Juanita, she was 89 years old, and spent the last eight years of her life in the nursing home with Alzheimer's. And this was the blessing of Alzheimer's. She had a son and a daughter, they both predeceased her, but she never knew it. And I thank God that disease spared her that pain. Within a year of each other, the brother and the sister passed. Well, she never knew it. Sometimes blessings come in strange ways. So I told them that I just want to come and mourn my aunt. They asked me to do the eulogy. I said I'd bring remarks on behalf of the family and her pastor can do the eulogy. She's been a member of that church for 70 years. Yeah. Well, for some reason they say the pastor can't be there. Now don't ask me. Yeah. And so I told him, well, I'll do what I can do. So, uh, if you will, just remember us in prayer on tomorrow. The first lady of our city, Sister Sherlane McCray de Blasio, has done a wonderful, wonderful job in her effort 
to bring to the fore and to bring to the attention of this city the problem of mental disease. Amen. She must be commended. In my time in New York, both as a student in the 80s and as a pastor for some 26 plus years here at the Calvary Church, I cannot remember a first lady who has done more in the city than this first lady has. Yeah. Yeah. Well, heck, we had two males that didn't even have a first lady. <laughs> and one of them was on the soft side. And the jury's still out on the other one. <laughs> Why do I have to be so bad? My I don't know. Help me. Help me. Uh, where's Timberlake? Say it. Say it. Say it for me. Thank you. Help him, Lord. Well, uh, whatever first ladies we've had, um, she is uh, hands down uh, the best first lady. And this issue of mental illness. Because you know everybody in New York is cray cray, don't you? The smart ones are the ones that leave. The rest of us, we just crazy. Amen. Moms Mabley say, if you find somebody who's not crazy, they just ain't well. But it's such an important issue. And the Lord laid on my heart some time ago, not because of her crusade, though I fully support it and agree with it, the Lord had laid on my heart to share a series of messages yeah. on the theme of depression. So many people are suffering with depression. Yeah. And so for the next several Sundays throughout the season of Lent, we're going to be talking about depression. Our text today is the 55th Psalm. We shall read from the New International Translation, verses 1 through 8. You will find the words on the monitors if you will stand so that we might read it together. Together, listen to my prayer, O oh God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. My thoughts trouble me, and I am distraught. Because of what my enemy is saying, because of the threats of the wicked, for they bring down suffering on me and assail me in their anger. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen on me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. I said, oh, that I had the wings of a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. I would flee far away and stay in the desert. I would hurry to my place of shelter, far from the tempest and storm. God bless you. You may be seated. Verse 6. I said, oh, that I had the wings of a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. Our title for this series is, When You Don't Have Dove's Wings. 
when you don't have doves wings and our title for the sermon today on facing depression bless you on facing depression now let me say to you that if you are human at some point you will be depressed There are gradations, grades, levels of depression. We are not today talking about what is described as clinical depression. Clinical depression is a mental disease. And hopefully these little messages will be helpful to you, but if you suffer from clinical depression, I highly recommend that you see a doctor. It is treatable. I do believe in faith healing. I do believe that God can heal all by himself. I've seen him do it right here in Calvary Baptist Church. But I also believe that God heals through doctors and through medicine. And there is no shame in going to the doctor and no shame in taking your medicine. One of the things that Sister McCray de Blasio is attempting to do is to remove the stigma around mental disease. Because if something is wrong with your heart, then you'd go see a doctor. If you got blood pressure, diabetes, you go see a doctor. If you got cancer, you'd go see a doctor. And just as you would go to see a doctor for physical ailments and disease, there is no shame in going to see a doctor for mental ailments and disease. I know it's a very, very touchy subject, but It is one that is so, so important. Amen. Uh, Amen. And, And I hope we take it very, very seriously. Amen. And encourage people who need medical help. Encourage them to get the help that they need. And Reverend Hall is number one. I'm preaching to myself because I'm the first one to call them cray cray and all of that. But I got to stop doing that. Amen. Amen. So let me say it one last time and get it out. They cray cray. That's what's wrong with them. They need to go see the doctor. They cray cray. Okay, I got it out. Timberlake. There you go. Now, Timberlake, you're going to have to get off the phone while I'm preaching now. Amen. Mm hmm. They always say that. They be on Facebook. Well, the truth of the matter is, amen, that all of us go through moments of depression. Now, clinical depression is when you have a conglomeration of symptoms There are many symptoms, but when you have a lot of those symptoms over a long period of time, you are clinically depressed. But those of us who just suffer our everyday variety of depression, it comes from time to time. Feeling depressed, feeling sad. Lord have mercy. Feeling down. Feeling depleted, that's what the depression is. Depression is like you're a balloon and something sticks a pin in your balloon and all the air goes out. Or if you will, since it's Super Bowl Sunday, you know, it's like a football and you let all the air out of the football so you can throw it. Oh, some of y'all missed that, didn't you? You know he's a cheater. He's a cheater. And his coaches are cheater. They were over there filming the Jets at their practice. They're cheaters. They don't even deserve to be in the Super Bowl. 
My sister told me, Vic, if you take your iPad while you're on the plane, you can watch the Super Bowl. I say, oh, the Dallas Cowboys going to be there. <laughs> then why would I watch it? I don't want Mr. Deflate Gate. I don't want to watch him win another Super Bowl. Because you know that's what's going to happen, right? Okay, all right. I've been watching football all my life. That's what's going to happen. I'm depressed because my Cowboys ain't in the Super Bowl. <laughs> Depression is, is, is a normal reaction to loss. It's a normal reaction to life struggles. It's a normal reaction to injured self-esteem. There, there are so many things. What, what happened with David was he talked about his circumstance. Circum, that which was around him. He was stand, his circumstanding. And many times it's our circumstances on the outside that cause us to be depressed and sad on the inside. The loss of a child. Yes. Or dealing with a child who is terminally ill. Oh, and if your child is well, if your child is healthy, let alone what he or she might be doing, just thank God if you've got, amen, a healthy child. And pray for your child every day that God will give them physical health and mental health and spiritual health and well-being. Yesterday they were talking about two football players, Eli Manning and... Larry Fitzgerald, they can receive the Walter Payton Award because they're working with young kids who are terminally ill with cancer. You can't even begin to imagine what it's like for a mother to know that you're watching your child day by day slip away. Oh, and you tell me you're not going to be depressed. Oh, Lord, have mercy. The loss of a child or dealing with terminal illness. Or, or, or as I told you, my own aunt, who for eight years, my mother went to see her twice a day, every day. Yeah. Mama said to me the other day when she called to tell me she had taken her flight home. She said, baby, God knew it was time for her to go. He was going to either have to take me or take her because I couldn't take it anymore. She had been so contorted by her sickness that you could not recognize her physical features any longer. The last time I went to see her when I was at home, I couldn't even say it to my mother, but I, I was saying, this is not Aunt Juanita. Sickness had so contorted her features. She died 60 pounds. And you got to go look at that every day for seven, eight years, twice a day. Yeah. And you ain't going to get depressed. Oh, yeah, yeah. Or maybe, maybe it's not the loss of a loved one, although we have had that. And we've had so much grief and, and, and bereavement lately. And a lot of us are dealing with the pain of the loss of a loved one right here in Calvary Church. And so when you see someone who's lost a loved one, put your arms around them and hug them and kiss them and just let them know, baby, I can't do much, but I'm praying for you. And I know what you're going through. You'd be surprised what one little act of kindness can do. Oh no, the loss of a parent is not an easy thing. There are those in our midst who are dealing with divorce. And we have our depression. When you gave your life to somebody, amen, and they kicked you to the curb. Or maybe it's financial trouble. The 
number one reason for divorce is finance. The number one reason for divorce is financial. And let me tell you something, amen, unless you got it rolling like Deacon Garrett. (laughs) When you look at your finances, you might get depressed. (laughs) And if Uncle Sam gets on your trail, you will be depressed. I told the congregation this morning, every American had one reason not to vote for Donald Trump. However you felt about him building the wall or his stance on immigration or whatever people may have liked about him, there was one reason not to vote for him. Here he is, a multi-billionaire who can stand on national TV and brag to you, amen, that he has never paid any taxes in 20 years. This man who wants to be your commander in chief and command the largest, most expensive, most powerful military in the history of the world paid for by the tax dollars of little people like you and me. And they went out and voted for him. I'm depressed. Oh, Marvin Gaye said, make me want to holler, throw up both my hands. And how many disappointments or the loss of a job or you're waiting for that promotion, but they promote somebody ahead of you, amen, because their skin color is not beautiful and brown like yours. Oh, don't sit up in here and act like you don't know what I'm talking about. It happens every day right here in New York City. When somebody gets that opportunity that you work so hard for and you know you deserve it, but someone with less qualifications got the opportunity. Oh, yes, circumstances all around us depress us. Here in our text in this 55th Psalm, David is depressed. David is depressed because he is hurt. And if you've ever been hurt, then you know that hurt, when you're hurt, you can become depressed. Oh, some strange things are going on in David's life. We are sure that when he wrote this 55th Psalm, it was during the time that he was on the lamb fleeing from his son, his favorite son, Absalom. But worse than that, his favorite son was now in collusion with his best friend, Ahitophel. Absalom and Ahitophel have come together and conspired to destroy David. Ahitophel told Absalom, look, go and rape your father's wives publicly so that all of Israel can see it. And Absalom did what Ahitophel said. And then he said, that's not enough. You need to kill David so that you can become king. You deserve to be king more than David. Ahithophel was David's ace, boom, coon. It was his ride or die dog. Ahithophel was his best friend. Oh, look what our text says. If an enemy were insulted me, I could endure it. If a foe were rising against me, I could hide. But it is you, a man like myself. He's talking to Ahithophel, my companion, my close friend. The reason I need to fly away like a dove is because my best friend has betrayed me. Look at what he says, with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship at the house. Now, you know that's lower than low. We boys, we used to watch the football game together and have a beer or two together. 
that's my boy. You remember Ahithophel when, when, when Absalom was born and I held him in my hands. When I finished, I passed him on. to You were there when my boy was born. And now you've colluded with my son. Amen. And now you've come to take my life. Ahithophel, when I went to the kingship and God made me king, you stood by my side as my right hand man. But now, Ahithophel, you have turned your hand against me. Whom I once enjoyed. We used to go to church together. Yeah. We used to sit on the same pew. Uh, we used to stand in the sanctuary and sing praises to our God. My hallelujah belongs to Lord have mercy. That, that was me and you, a hit or fail. Yeah. Well, let me tell you something. Nobody can hurt you like the people who are closest to you. <laughs> Listen to David. My companion attacks his friend. He violates his covenant. His talk is smooth as butter, yet war is in his heart. His words, look, he, he's talking smack to David, but meantime, he's plotting to kill him. His words are more soothing than all, yet they are drawn swords. Nobody hurts us like people who are nearest and dearest to us. Yeah. Let me tell you something. Your enemy can't betray you. Your enemy is your enemy. And whatever your enemy does to you, you expect an enemy to do. It's the people who are closest to you, the people that you love, the people who are nearest and dearest. They are the ones who can hurt you the most. Your enemy can't get close enough to hurt you the way a friend can hurt you. Be careful about everybody smiling in your face. Be careful about these folk. You think they some kind of spiritual juggernaut. Look like they just stepped out of heaven. They are the ones, Lord have mercy, when you turn your back. How did the OJ say it? They smile in your face. But all the time, Lord have mercy. Lord, they can quote the OJs better than Amazing Grace. You know what your enemy, your enemy hates you. Your enemy wants to undo you. It's your friend. It's the one that you love. Shakespeare wrote the play Julius Caesar. Caesar had crossed the Rubicon, Lord have mercy. <laughs> Nobody could withstand his army. He came in and disbanded the Senate and took over and made himself the emperor and got rid of the democracy. Yeah. If it happened in Rome, it can happen in America. Somebody say amen. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, don't put too much trust in these folk. Yeah. They do what they want to do. So the Senate came together and decided to kill Caesar. One by one, every senator came and thrust him through with their knives. Yeah. One by one, yeah. they stabbed Caesar. But it was only one stab that hurt. He looked up and saw his dear friend, Brutus. Yeah. All of the other senators, he never said a word, but when Brutus stabbed him, Et tu, Brute? Yeah. You, Brutus? Oh, I knew they were my enemies, but you were my sworn friend. You, you Brutus, have stabbed me today. Yeah. You know, Jesus... What hurt him the most was not Herod or Pilate. Because he knew Herod and he knew Pilate. The Bible says that Herod hated Pilate and Pilate hated Herod, but that night they became friends to come against Jesus. 
That's what your enemies will do. Your enemies will form allowance, alliances just so that they can get at you. Oh, you better be careful. Watch, it. Watch those folk that smile in your face all the time. But what hurt him was not Pilate and it was not Herod because Jesus knew that Pilate and Herod were petty politicians who do what politicians do to save their political hide. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What hurt him was not Peter's denial because he knew what Peter was going to do. He had already prophesied. He said, look at here, Peter. You're around here unsheathing your sword, cutting off folks' ears. You all front and no back. You all talk and no walk. Yeah. When this thing really goes down, before the rooster crows in the morning, Peter, you will have denied me three times. He wasn't hurt by Peter because he knew what Peter was going to do. And guess what? He was not hurt by the betrayal of Judas. Jesus knew who Judas was when he called him. That's why he called him so he could carry out, Lord have mercy, his role in the divine plan for your salvation. Jesus knew from the beginning who Judas was. He knew that Judas was his enemy. That didn't hurt him. And when the other ten disciples mysteriously fled, none of them, John, Andrew, go down the list, none of them were there. That didn't hurt him because Jesus knew human nature and he knew the fear and the fright that gripped their souls and how they ran away to save their own lives. He expected that. There was only one thing that hurt him. It was that day at Calvary. And he looked up into the heavens and said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. I expected Herod and Pilate to do what they did. I expected Caiaphas with his jealous, envious self to do what he did. I knew what Peter would do. I knew what Judas would do. But Eli, Eloi, lama sabachthani, why have you, my God, forsaken me? What hurt him the most is when his own father turned his back. Yeah. Oh, it's the people who are closest to you who drive the dagger in the deepest. Oh, y'all don't want to say amen, but I'm telling you, I'm all up in the ketchup here today. Don't, don't make me mad and make me start calling names. Many of us are living today with the scars, not of what enemies have done, but what those who are closest to us have done. And I say many are living with the scars, but if you have scars, then that's good news. Because if you have a scar, that means healing has taken place. Some of us don't even have scars. We are living with open, gaping wounds. parent who preferred one child over the other and you've been living under that cloud all of your life that you're not good enough. That mama loves you more or less than she loves someone else. And you still wonder why. Why did daddy leave? Well, how many are here in this place today? Lord have mercy. Growing up without mother or father orphaned And all your life you've been trying to find daddy, find mama, find out why daddy left, why mama left. It's not just a scar, it's a gaping wound. Oh, I'm telling you, it comes from a mother, it comes from a father, or maybe a sister, or maybe a brother, or maybe a wife or a husband. Wounds that we carry each and every day. Yes, many times we get depressed. We feel alone. We feel overwhelmed. We feel depressed. You know what? Y'all about as quiet as they were this morning. You said, Lord have mercy, that you were going to say amen. But I guess this just ain't one of them little amen sermons. 
but to Dong, you can't come to my party. <laughs> you can't come to my party, to Dong. <laughs> Help me, somebody. That was for Naya. She know what I'm talking about. You remember that depression, don't you, Naya? Uh huh. Yeah, my baby was depressed. But that's all right. Look at her now. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Tadone is just a forgotten memory. Look at my baby now. <laughs> now I say, Tadone, you can't come. <laughs> oh, she was heartbroken that day, but look at her now. My hallelujah belongs to you. I want to tell you three things David did, and I'm finished. I was going to try to rush, but since y'all ain't saying amen, well, it's too late now. <laughs> Somebody say, Reverend, this sermon is depressing me. <laughs> My hallelujah belongs. Oh, we bless you today, Father. My hallelujah belongs to you. Well, let me go real quick. I'm going to give you three points, and then we finish. How to face your depression. We all have it. We have our moments, ups and downs. If you have a lot of depression over a long period of time, it's clinical. Go see a doctor. But even if you're clinical, I want to share something with you today that helps all of us. Number one, if you're going to face your depression, you have to face your circumstances. Yeah. Face your circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think about my pastor, the late E.K. Bailey. Hardly a day goes by that I don't think some lesson I learned from him, either by precept or example, but he used to say to us, you got to face what's facing you. So many people want to run away. Oh, that I had the wings of a dove. I'd fly away and be at rest. That's what David wanted to do. But as you read this psalm, what you discover is that David rolled up his sleeves and said, no, no, I ain't running from the problem. I'm going to deal with this problem. You can't run. You can't hide. You don't have the wings of a dove. You're not allowed that luxury. Many of us think that somehow if we go to sleep, the problem's going to disappear tomorrow. No. Tomorrow is just going to be worse. Yeah. Or maybe if you get drunk or get high, but when you come down off your drunk, off your high, you're going to have the same problem. You got to face it. You got to deal with it. They passed over you, amen, and gave what belonged to you to someone else, then you need to go, amen, and stand up for your rights and deal with it. Your mother has wounded you, said things that hurt you all your life, then you need to sit down and have a little talk with mama. Oh, and I know it's not easy. Or maybe just write her a letter and begin the conversation, but you got to start dealing with the situation. Your problems ain't going to vanish. And you can't wish them away and you can't take the wings of a dove. Yeah. You got to deal with what's facing you. And David understood. Oh, I, I, I wish I could take the wings of a dove. You know, sometimes, Calvary, I'm going to tell you the truth. I wish I could just get on a plane and fly to Jamaica, get on the beach and earn 20%. That was a line from the movie Die Hard. Come on. <laughs> My 
my movie people. Y'all know what I'm talking about. But no, no. I remember Dr. King in Oslo when he received the Nobel Peace Prize. He talked about how wonderful to receive such an honor. He says, but I can't stay up on this mountain. I got to go back to, the, I got to face what's facing me. Black folk, we've got to face what's facing us. We're all depressed and complaining about racism. Then what are we doing about it? Vernon Johns used to say that it is a sin for a man to ride your back. And then he said, but it is a greater sin for you to let a man ride your back. So we can sit around and complain and moan and be long-faced about what white folk are doing to us, amen. Or we can get up off of our can and start praying and marching. And uh, yes, yes, we still got to do it. We are still in those times. Start fighting and start, amen, believing that you can make a difference. But you got to face what's facing you. But then in verses 16 through 19, David doesn't just face his circumstances. He faces the throne of God. Oh, look what he says in verse 16. As for me, I call to the Lord. I pray to the Lord and the Lord saves me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. He rescues me unharmed from the battle waged against me, even though many oppose me. David could have said, oh, man, let's get together. I'm going to kill Absalom. He's not worth being my son. I'm going to kill Ahitophel. Yes, my friend who has betrayed me. He could have thought, and a lot of people do that. We take it personally, and we try to go after people, but your are Battle is not with people, Lord have mercy. You wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. David said, no, I'm not going to go after Absalom. I'm not going after Ahithophel. I'm going to the throne of grace, uh, and I'm going to take my case to the Lord. You need to pray about it. We underestimate the power of prayer because we don't know what prayer can do. And the power we have when we come together as God's people and pray, we will move mountains and chop down forests and move every impediment in our way, amen, when we come together to pray, when we pray as God's people, there will be healing, and there will be deliverance, and there will be victory. David said, oh, that I had the wings of a dove. He didn't want the wings of an eagle, or the wings of the mighty condor, or even the wings of a hawk, those powerful birds. No, he wanted the wings of the dove because he wanted to be at peace. The dove was a symbol of peace. Your peace is in your prayer. Angela Cooper sent me a line the other day. I told her I was going to use it. Thank you, Angela. It simply said, prayer is the voice of faith. Yes, the power of prayer. And we underestimate the power of prayer. Our city councilman, I, Danique Miller, had the funeral of his father here at Calvary Church. The father had asked Reverend Isaiah Holland to eulogize him, and so Reverend Holland did. And I'll never forget what Reverend Holland said in that sermon, in that eulogy. He said, people come to me and they tell me that when they were living in sin before they got saved, they didn't enjoy their life of sin. He said, that's a lie. He said, I'm going to tell you, when I was living in sin before I got saved, I enjoyed my life of sin. He said, if you didn't enjoy your sin, you wasn't doing it right. (laughs) (laughs) If you don't know the power of prayer, then you ain't been praying right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 
David said, in the morning, I'm going to pray. And at noon, I'm going to pray. And at night, I'm going to pray. And I'm going to keep on praying. I'm keep on going to the throne. And you know what our problem is? We throw up one little flimsy prayer, and then we say prayer doesn't work. Jesus said, no, no, if you keep on knocking and keep on asking and keep on searching, then you will get what you have asked to get. Yes, prayer does work. There is power in prayer when we come together in the morning, when we come together at noonday, when we come together in the nighttime. If God's people would just keep on praying, your peace is in your prayer depressed about that boy that didn't work out that daughter that's gone astray you need to bombard the throne of grace face God's throne take it to him David didn't try to take matters into his own hand he took his situation to God he said at night and day we're going to pray this year our theme is prayer 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 I want us to be a praying church somebody say amen amen And I want every member involved in our prayer life. Because our power is in prayer. And God knows if we ever needed it. You just keep on. Amen. I told you the other day, sometimes God will put an evil king on the throne. Folk that ain't been to church in a long time. Talk about depression. Look at David. He's committed to prayer. Here he is on the lamb, on the run. But every morning, every noonday, every night, he's praying and he's praying. And let me tell you, if we'll pray right, amen, God will answer right. Amen. Feel a little prayer wheel turning. Know a little fire is burning. Just a little talk with you. Lord have mercy. Just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. You must face your problem. Don't run from it. Deal with it. Face God's throne. How to face your depression. Face God's throne. But thirdly and finally, face your future. Verses 22 and 23. Cast your cares on the Lord. Mm. He will sustain you. Read that with me. Cast your cares on the Lord. No, 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 no. I want you to say he will sustain me. When we get to that part, say me. Let's do it again. Cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain me. He will never let me be shaken. Lord, have mercy. Verse 23. But you, God, will bring down the wicked into the pit of decay, the bloodthirsty and deceitful, will not live out half their days. But as for me, you know what David is saying? He faced his situation. His son, his own son, his best friend, Ahithophel, have colluded and conspired to take his life. He said, I'm going to deal with it. He faced his circumstances. He faced the throne. And he took it to God. But when you take it to God, leave it with God. You say, how do I do it? Tell God, God, I'm putting it in your hand and I'm finished with it. Work it out the way you see best. If you're still worried about it, then you haven't left it at the throne. You need to go back to the throne room because God has already guaranteed your future. Cast your cares on him. He will sustain you. He will fight your battles. He will bring you victory. 